thanks everyone for joining uh, again. Um, uh, this uh, is uh, a talk by the State Silk Museum in Tbilisi, Georgia, as part of the Art Prospect Network talks uh, that uh, touches upon the topics of socially engaged art in post-Soviet countries and uh, is uh, also a continuation, somehow continues the dialogue from the publication Miracle or Misunderstanding. CC Arts Link uh, uh, is organizing uh, the network uh, called Art Prospect, uh, which includes uh, a lot of post-Soviet countries, so to say, and uh, from each country there are different organizations and partners, and uh, the one from Georgia is a uh, Silk Museum, and uh, we've done a lot of different activities as part of uh, art prospect. The publication that I've mentioned is also available online uh, on uh, web pages of CCR Sync and Art Prospect, so you can easily find it there. Uh, as for uh, today's talk, uh, we decided to sort of like we will be doing a presentation and dialogue between uh, three curators of the Silk Museum. I am uh, Dati Chigolashvili, curator of international programs. I'd like to uh, ask my colleagues to introduce themselves, please. I'm Salome Pachuashvili. I'm a collection curator at the museum. And I'm Mariam Shargalashvili, exhibition curator at the Silk Museum. Uh, thank you. And uh, today's talk, uh, the title of today's talk we decided, uh, uh, as we decided, is Cocoons and Threads, Collections and Connections, which is a little bit of a wordplay uh, with uh, two bigger projects that we did as part of our Art Prospect at the museum. And then we will try to talk uh, about uh, different collections and how we try to connect it to different uh, activities nowadays to think the museum, its specificity, its role, its uh, social engagement, and uh, uh, many other topics among uh, these. Uh, we'll try to talk for about 15 minutes or just uh, under an hour, and then leave time for questions and answers. So please use the section, uh, the chat section of Zoom to uh, share your thoughts or comments or questions uh, towards the end. Uh, we'll keep uh, microphones of uh, other microphones uh, turned off. Uh, to avoid uh, technical challenges, because it's um, quite hard <laughs> in this online format already. Um, and it's uh, before we start the presentation, uh, we'd also like to say that uh, May 18th, it's the International Museum Day. And uh, since it's this week connected to this day, uh, we somehow tried to conceptualize today's event also as a part uh, of uh, this and connected to the theme, which is the future of museums recover and uh, reimagine. Uh, so before we start to, uh, I mean, uh, as we need to start to talk all about this, maybe some of you uh, know uh, a little bit more about the museum, maybe some of you don't know, so it's always important to establish the context and history. So uh, I think Salome is a very good person who can uh, do that and tell us about the history of the State Silk Museum. Salome, please. Okay, let me share my screen. You see it, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So I'll try very briefly uh, to talk about the history of the museum, um, uh, uh, which dates back to 1887, um, when um, uh, the Caucasian Sericulture Station was established in uh, Tbilisi, which was a, a big research, uh, scientific and uh, educational center. Um, for the whole Caucasus, which was by that time part of the Russian Empire. Uh, and uh, the aim of, for this um, institution, this station, um, the uh, aim of this uh, establishment of this station was uh, uh, to help um, uh, sericulture develop in the region and uh, uh, to raise awareness about um, production uh, among the um, uh, local uh, people. Uh, of course, uh, silk production uh, was had a quite big history in the region, uh, but uh, by that time uh, there was a big problem in this field uh, because 
um, a, a silkworm uh, disease called Tebrin um, burst out uh, in Europe and then from Europe came to Caucasus. Uh, and uh, um, the sericulture was uh, on the edge of uh, dying, we can say. Um, and um, uh, the uh, French uh, scientist uh, Louis Pasteur uh, established uh, a method of preventing this disease. And then um, uh, this kind of patient was established in different countries in uh, Europe um, uh, to uh, work with this uh, Pasteur method and uh, uh, try uh, to um, help uh, and develop uh, sericulture. Um, and um, the founder of the uh, the sericulture station in Tbilisi was uh, Nikolai Shavrov, who was uh, sent uh, by Russians uh, to Tbilisi, uh, and uh, he um, learned in Europe all about uh, these uh, new methods, and then uh, he founded this uh, whole complex, which was located in uh, Mushtaid uh, um, Garden, uh, which was a uh, quite a big space, and uh, mm, uh, they um, built around uh, 24 buildings. It was a big complex, and um, uh, here is uh, a part uh, of the plan of this station. Uh, this uh, pink um, ones are the buildings, uh, par several, several of them, and then uh, these are some mulberry nurseries, which they arranged uh, for the Culture. And this uh, big building here is um, the museum building, which still exists, uh, that we saw here. So uh, uh, part of this um, uh, complex of the uh, sericulture station was a museum originally, because uh, uh, the station had an um, educational function. They had free courses for um, people who wanted to study uh, silk production, and uh, uh, so the museum um, served as an um, educational space uh, for people to see with their own eyes uh, what how every step was uh, being done. So uh, there was a museum and a library. These are uh, interiors, um, which uh, have um, survived to this day. Uh, and um, uh, it is very important that uh, the uh, furniture has also survived uh, from that period. And, uh, um, uh, the architect of the building and designer of the furniture was uh, Polish architect uh, Alexander Szymkiewicz, uh, uh, who also designed other uh, buildings in Tbilisi in the 19th century. Uh, and um, the building uh, had a very interesting artist architecture because it is a mix of different styles. Uh, and uh, as you might notice, it's a little bit small here, but so there are some architectural details uh, which uh, are related to sericulture, some silkworms and butterflies and mm, so on. So uh, this uh, um, up here is the uh, interior of the museum and uh, we can send you the uh, link for a virtual reality tour, which we did last year, and uh, you can see in details um, our um, main exhibition. Um, and then here is the library, which also has this uh, original architecture. Uh, and um, as uh, for the collections, um, uh, we have a very big variety uh, of uh, um, the types of collections because uh, um, they were gathering uh, from uh, all over Caucasus and also from different countries, uh, every different type of objects that were somehow connected to uh, sericulture for educational purposes and also for archiving. And uh, that's why we have uh, uh, like biology collection of silkworm, uh, then uh, mulberry uh, tree related um, objects, of uh, silkworm dyes, for example, you should, so silk dyes, uh, um, and also some uh, mock-ups, uh, uh, cocoons, uh, threads, uh, uh, photographs uh, from 19th and 20th century, uh, and uh, silkworm egg carrying boxes, which you see up here, and many different collections, um, uh, which uh, are uh, most of them are um, were exhibited in our um, exhibition hall, but is now packed for the um, reconstru building reconstruction uh, purpose. Uh, so I think uh, that's 
very briefly about the museum and now yeah, uh, thank you, Salome. Uh, what Salome also mentioned is that uh, from time to time we will be putting certain links in the chat section. Uh, over here, I've already provided a link uh, from our blog, uh, which is to the uh, uh, virtual reality of the museum's exhibition hall and the library uh, made last year uh, during the pandemic, like when the pandemic started in the spring when there was first wave of lockdown uh, and yeah it, it looks a little bit different now it will look uh, much different uh, after the renovation I guess but uh, it's also a good opportunity to see it also comes with texts uh, of collections so if you feel like exploring and uh, you uh, have a motivation to see another virtual reality of the museum uh, please do so it's still available uh, what Salome was talking about is very important and we constantly try to rethink uh, this uh, aspect in our contemporary activities and one of the uh, most important ones and sort of like foundation of one of the directions of uh, the many directions that the Silk Museum has been working on um, came, uh, it, was, yeah, it was one of the first initiatives uh, in this direction, the bigger one that had to do uh, with uh, um, the neighborhood of the museum itself uh, because it was so spread and nowadays there's actually only yeah, two buildings right remaining from uh, the station and uh, one of them uh, consists of mention. private houses and the other one is the museum building itself which used to be the main uh, main building of the station the museum and the library from the beginning so we, we worked on uh, a, as part of our prospect we worked on a festival called memory threads museums and neighborhoods that uh, was uh, trying to uh, think about these topics, like the history of the Silk Museum and its relation to the neighborhood uh, historically, but also what uh, connection can it have today uh, for the neighborhood? Uh, and also to talk about uh, the public spaces in Tbilisi, which is uh, quite a, a challenging topic in itself. So it was uh, quite a, quite an uh, interesting approach to it because also the, so to say, the choreography of the festival, it uh, followed uh, the artworks inside the museum, in museums outside spaces, such as the backyard and the garden, but also the uh, public spaces or other private spaces around the museum. And uh, it was, uh, well, I, I was one of uh, the curators together with Maria Shergelashvili, Anina Kuprava and Nini Palavandishvili. And uh, the, uh, one of the bigger, bigger parts uh, of the festival was uh, interventions in public spaces or the artworks in public spaces that Mariam, you were working uh, together with Nini, uh, particularly on this topic. So if you could share uh, a little bit uh, yeah, sure. about some of the works from this, please. Yeah, yeah, sure. I will just start with sharing my screen firstly. And uh, thank you for mentioning this project because I think it was one of the important did, have you seen the screen, right? We see the screen, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Uh, so it's a like main poster about this event, uh, Memory Threads Museum and Neighborhood, which we organized in 2018 uh, in the framework of cooperation with the Art Pro Prospect Network and CSERT's link, uh, as Data mentioned. And the important topic was that, yes, uh, we tried to think about the museum's current role in terms of the connection of the neighborhood and public spaces. And there we are 10 different projects uh, which has been organized uh, during of the festival but some of them was like a real interventions of the um, itself museum outside uh, space and uh, as well uh, like neighborhood areas which Salome already mentioned uh, which is allocated in Mushtaidi garden and uh, like uh, Didube district actually uh, and I just wanted to um, share with you this uh, like opening uh, this this image from the opening it's uh, just like uh, our visitors and our garden as you see and here in the uh, front uh, um, uh, front, uh, you see the uh, one of the intervention actually. It's the uh, artwork of Dana Iskakova, uh, like gardening project. We can say which was like public was actually invited to um, plant uh, um, the like the plants in the, our garden, and actually uh, uh, Dana uh, very interestingly uh, um, uh, conceptualized this concept of the neighborhooding 
uh, because, uh, for example, uh, uh, she mentioned that there the neighbors are important not only for the like uh, friends, but also the, uh, sorry, not only for the uh, like people, but the plants are already the neighbors. And uh, she researched the uh, mulberry tree uh, like friendly uh, plants uh, and made this carpet weaving with the plants, as you see in the image. And uh, it was like we uh, tried to engage the public with this uh, like ecological idea, which is also connects, connects this very important plant of the mulberry, uh, which is, as you know, very uh, the main food of the silkworm. Uh, so in our gar garden, it's also the mulberry tree. And uh, so this was like very beautiful intervention. Um, and there was the, some visitors. Actually, this is one of the project of, from the um, Georgian Artists uh, Cooperation, Naili and Tamar Bojorishvili. They made this cognitive uh, bench, interactive cognitive bench. And this bench was like playful uh, um, uh, installation in the garden, installed in the garden as well. And it gives the visitors information about the collection. And uh, then they were invited to see the main uh, um, connection inside of the building. So we tried uh, in this exhibition, we tried to connect outside interventions and like uh, also connect with the museum itself uh, to make such kind of connections. Uh, this is also a very interesting intervention in, uh, in terms of the public space and neighbor, uh, neighborhood. Uh, you see that this is like Mushtaidi Garden and uh, this is like the pavilion. It's called this artwork called the Silk Pavilion. And it was specially designed and constructed on site by um, artist Leila Musayeva from Azerbaijan. Here is her team as well, who helped her. And uh, her aim was to make uh, such kind of uh, dedicated pa silk pavilion uh, in the neighborhood. Uh, and uh, you know that uh, um, from Salome already that Mishtaidi Park was very important uh, neighborhood of the museum and currently it's our like one of the very interesting partner and they um, give us the possibility to um, to like uh, put this um, pavilion there, uh, which is like nearby the one of the oldest uh, mulberry tree. Um, and uh, so this uh, carton, like red carton is already sil also silk material. And uh, the aim was to think about silk and its uh, uh, tactility as well in, in terms of this pavilion. And uh, one of the highlights from the festival uh, was this project by uh, anthropologist Anna Parkosadze. Uh, she also, uh, actually this house is, uh, which we already mentioned, like Staff House, which is lo uh, located in front of the museum. And uh, this is now private house. People are uh, like living there. And uh, with curators, uh, Anna was interviewing uh, these persons and trying to uh, think about what they are thinking about the museum and the uh, as uh, as the what they are how they are identifying uh, themselves as a neighbors of the museum, the historical place. And uh, then uh, we just tried to make this uh, textile prints um, in connection uh, with the images of this house. And some there were some historical uh, um, images as well uh, from our uh, archive and uh, also the quotes uh, from the interview interviews. And this was like allocated as a, um, uh, as you see in uh, some balconies of the places. And we try to really engage the uh, persons who are living in the house to uh, just not to present the artwork itself, but also to, uh, um, to, um, to give a person poss possibility to be a part of this uh, artwork itself. And it was very interesting process, like research-based process. Mm, and the last highlight, uh, which I just want to mention briefly, uh, is the uh, um, 
um, Ukrainian artist Mikhail Churikov's uh, project. It was like sound installation. And it was very interesting that Mitya uh, tried to connect not only the museum uh, sounds, um, he collected the museum sounds and you see the backyard of the museum on the right side uh, of the image and the uh, left side, uh, the uh, first image on the left side, it is uh, from the Union of Deaf of Georgia. Uh, and uh, so the artist was working uh, on site of this. Um, there was no so much time to really cooperate with the uh, deaf persons, uh, but uh, he tried to collect some noises from this institution and uh, tried to combine it on, on a sound installation. And so visitors have the possibility to uh, see the one part of the uh, sound installation in the backyard and also to, you know, connected uh, it with the, uh, um, our neighboring area uh, where is um, allocated this deaf union of um, Georgia. So it was like some highlights which I just wanted to show you the variety of the projects which we, we are hosted in very short time uh, period and uh, it uh, gives us uh, uh, thinking how many creative methods we can uh, um, we can elaborate to engage our neighbors and to think them that uh, hey the historical building the museum uh, we are here and we just want to cooperate with you and uh, yeah it was a very nice experience in terms of that um, and also we, uh, uh, this festival not only included the exhibition itself, but also some parallel programs and it was like artistic, uh, artistic tours uh, in the neighborhood area, which was data uh, co-curated uh, and so he can um, briefly talk about this project and um, share his experience. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Mariam. Um... Yeah, I'll talk briefly about uh, the artistic tours that we did. Uh, and I'd like to share a presentation with you, but I first need to find it uh, because it used to allow me to share. Um, one second, please. I'm having some technical difficulties. Uh, I should be able to share just the presentation but you don't see yeah. it yet do you no 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 mm, okay i think it should work now no yeah now we see yeah okay yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, back to the area that we were talking about. This picture was not, it is from uh, last year uh, during lockdown. Uh, I took it uh, from my window and I, I am also, when we talk about the museum and the neighborhood, I'm myself also one of the neighbors mm -hmm. of the museum. And you see the museum here on the right side. Um, I, I hope you see. Uh, the roof of it and little red brick building, which seems uh, quite small compared to the big Dinamo Stadium that is neighboring us. And the rest of the area uh, that is next to the river where you see the trees, it's uh, the Mushtaidi Garden. And this is where, uh, this area here is where the Caucasian Sericulture Station used to be. This is what we're talking about. Um, and uh, as part of the artistic tours, one of them uh, by Katarina Stadler uh, called Dinamo Soundscape uh, was about our uh, big neighbor, Dinamo Stadium, and uh, the uh, other one by Elena Gabricidze and Ono Dirker is called Mulberry Slow Race. And I will uh, briefly tell you about uh, the Mulberry Slow Race. Mm -hmm. And uh, first of all, I think it's um, uh, just in case someone doesn't know why we talk so much about the Mulberries and why is Mulberry so important, uh, is that it's uh, the uh, silkworms, uh, they are very picky. They are not going to eat anything else but the mulberry leaves to give us silk. I mean, there's a substitute for a few days, but they want mulberry leaves. So the Caucasian Sericulture Station was uh, working very actively uh, on mulberry cultivation. There were a lot of nurseries and later also the Institute to develop new hybrids, to work on what would basically support the production more. And at the museum, uh, there uh, is now half-packed uh, Marlborough room. Um, and here is the intervention by 
on a dirker. It was also as part of the festival. And everything in the Mulberry Room uh, is uh, not, I mean, it's actually not very green. And then these photographs here, they somehow brought the green color into the room. Uh, this is from the research project that a group of artists was uh, working on together with the museum uh, for a few years uh, before uh, the festival in 2018. And um, they were focusing on the history or, and, the, uh, and the neighborhood of the museum through the remaining mulberry trees uh, that are uh, scattered there. And there's quite a lot. And actually, they will be giving fruits very soon. So uh, the neighborhood will change quite a lot because of that. Uh, and uh, uh, based on this experience, artists Ono Dirker and Elena Gabricidze uh, were invited to collaborate uh, and make an artistic tour, with, which is called Mulberry very slow race. It comes in English and Georgian as this kind of brochures that everyone actually still today can do on their own. Uh, it's basically, uh, I'll show you a certain aspects and pages from it. Uh, I think it's very important that these kind of tours, they're experienced on site. So I advise you when you're in Tbilisi, if you have a possibility uh, to stop by and go on this tour, we can give you the publication. Please contact us. Um, and this is uh, basically the idea. So uh, the tree number one would be a museum. Uh, the tree number two would be next to uh, the former employee's house. Uh, building uh, which you see how close they are and then it goes in Mushtaid garden and then follows the street and other areas so we will cover this but the idea is that through the stories and stops at the trees it tells the story of the neighborhood and how it changed during a century and more actually and how different layers of history are kept there that we don't otherwise really uh, see unless we know this. So here uh, we'll see some of the photos. This is already in uh, the garden in, uh, in front of the museum. Uh, then uh, the tour would also go in a high-rise building where the photo was taken from that I showed you earlier that overlooked the area because it's also a very nice imagination to see this archival material, contemporary material, and, and also hear the stories and imagine it from the bird's eye uh, perspective. And then it would lead to the street uh, farther uh, in the neighborhood, go uh, behind the building where internally displaced persons uh, from Abkhazia were settled years ago. Uh, this is the gardens that they developed uh, behind, which uh, nowadays does not look like this, but it's still private gardens that are there. Um, uh, this is uh, more inside those uh, vegetable gardens or um, and then it would lead to uh, the more residential uh, area where the trees are still there. And these are just the photos that were collected where, you know, people are picking up fruits uh, because the fruits, the silkworms, the uh, fruits are not important for them. The leaves are important for them. And uh, the fruits is something that people like. But uh, what's... Um, interesting with this kind of approach is that this uh, history and the layers that I mentioned that are uh, not really visible uh, and then telling it through, uh, you know, the trees, a particular tree in the neighborhood, which many people might not even know why these trees are there. Some of them were planted on purpose. Some of them were distributed uh, by wind uh, in time. And then this kind of um, artistic approach and the tour uh, combines this information and shows not only the story of the Caucasian sericulture station, but it also shows uh, uh, the layers of the city and the public spaces and their privatization that we were talking about and how much the city has changed. And it allows you to think through this uh, more or less a small part of the city about similar areas of the city too, or like similar uh, tendencies um, uh, in the city. Uh, so now after, I think uh, we are talking about the outside of the museum a lot, and we should also go a little bit inside and talk about the, uh, well, uh, collections that are inside the museum and how some of uh, Art Prospect projects were dealing with that. And I think it will be important if, Salome, if you could tell us, uh, well, we talked about Mulberries, which is the beginning of the silk production, and to talk a little bit about the, uh, the end process of it, which is the textile and the textile collection that the museum uh, has. 
so I talked very briefly about the various collections that the museum has, uh, but I didn't mention one of the most important, obviously one of the most important collections, which is textiles. Uh, and um, we have a very um, interesting and different kinds of uh, textiles uh, uh, from the 19th century, uh, from the 20th century as well, and uh, 21st also. Uh, so uh, first of all, um, let's talk about uh, earlier, earlier collections, which is uh, um, Caucasian handicraft uh, textiles. Uh, first of all, we can mention uh, uh, so-called jejims, which is um, which are kind of uh, rugs uh, which were uh, woven in uh, Caucasus, uh, and uh, they are made of silk and uh, cotton uh, um, mixed. Uh, and but it, this is a lower quality silk, uh, and uh, um, these kind of handicraft textiles were um, collected by the museum uh, employees uh, who um, uh, used to go on expeditions around Caucasus and uh, do research about local traditions, uh, photograph them and uh, collect uh, uh, some of the materials uh, uh, to document their um, traditions about silk making. And another uh, one of these um, uh, handicraft collections uh, is uh, um, called the uh, Kelagai, which is uh, uh, Azerbaijani technique of uh, making uh, scarves, um, uh, which is uh, quite similar to batik technique uh, and uh, uses some uh, molds and um, wax to make uh, this kind of ornaments on very thin uh, silk um, textile. Um, and then we have uh, interesting um, albums, textile albums, uh, and uh, this is the one uh, from uh, Uzbekistan, from Samarkand. There was a, a merchant, Mirza Bukharin, who uh, traveled to Caucasus uh, and uh, um, he uh, gave this uh, textile album to the museum and it has uh, some handwritten labels with different kind of uh, Uzbek uh, textiles in them, so it is also quite uh, interesting um, collection uh, and um, uh, then uh, also from the 19th century we have uh, this uh, silk lace collection which comes from germany munich uh, um, and um, uh, this was uh, most centrally brought by uh, the founder of the museum nikolai shavro from germany when he traveled uh, there for getting some information and uh, those are um, made uh, on uh, um, a liver loom uh, and uh, uh, this was um, Rosa Klauber's manufacturer uh, who was a Jew and then uh, this family moved to the United States during World War II so it has another very interesting story behind it and then we have uh, quite a big and um, beautiful collection of uh, jacquard uh, textiles uh, uh, from France mostly, uh, but from other countries too. Uh, the small samples of uh, different types of uh, um, colorful jacquard textiles from 19th century as well. Uh, and uh, also uh, quite a, uh, only several um, uh, rugs, silk uh, um, carpets, sorry, uh, but um, they are uh, quite interesting too. Uh, only three, four of them. Uh, and um, uh, then, um, last but not the least, uh, we have this uh, uh, Soviet period industrial textiles. Uh, um, but in the Soviet period, uh, the silk um, industry was quite big. Uh, um, in uh, Georgia, uh, there were several uh, factories uh, and uh, um, uh, other um, different kinds of uh, um, small factories which um, will produce uh, threads uh, and uh, so on. So uh, it was um, all over the country, it was very uh, spread and developed. Uh, and uh, this is how our uh, different textiles are shown um, in the museum. Uh, uh, we have these old showcases, uh, as I mentioned earlier, and uh, it can be quite challenging to show them in uh, 
this kind of um, environment, but uh, uh, we are trying different uh, um, different uh, forms of uh, the presentation. So um, I think um, we can uh, talk more about the um, the Soviet period uh, industrial textiles uh, because uh, we had very interesting uh, research projects uh, about it uh, last year, which I think Tata will tell us yeah, more uh, about. Yeah, th thank you, Salome. Uh, indeed, it was a very interesting project which uh, uh, we did as part of, uh, again, uh, Art Prospect. Uh, uh, and the project that it was uh, sort of, sort of say, as we called it, a support residence in the, uh, during the pandemic, uh, which uh, the title that we came out with was Outside the Cocoon, uh, how to present art publicly during the pandemic. Because as you remember, the times were very confusing in the beginning and what to do with art and how to work on things and how to support each other in the work. And uh, what we decided is that with invited artists and curators, uh, we were, um, we decided to work on the topic of collection and archives at the museum and paid a uh, big attention to the topic of uh, industrial textiles that we have which is a uh, huge material that we need to research which of course goes beyond the just the textiles and is connected to the industry and a lot of things that happened in uh, industry and post-industrial times especially regarding silk production which was uh, Tbilisi silk green factory and an uh, entire country was actually involved in silk production and was uh, uh, massive uh, well in terms of you know uh, bringing silkworms or uh, collecting cocoons and then producing textile itself etc and then since the 90s uh, as many other industries the silk uh, production entirely stopped in the country so there's uh, this big uh, gap and cut and then it sort of like needs uh, a lot of work and rethinking so uh, a lot of uh, concentration uh, during this project was on uh, industrial textiles and what was interesting because of the times as well I think many of us were able to um, also I mean it somehow you know turned into a research phase and a reflection phase so we were able to research a lot but some works were also created we made an online uh, online discussions actually uh, uh, with artists and curators, curators in the project uh, that are available on the museum's Facebook page, though those were in Georgian. Uh, we did uh, yeah, intervention by the museum uh, with the playing with the online form as well, and a lot of future perspectives emerged with uh, artistic and curatorial forms. So, and Mariam, you did a very uh, nice uh, sum up in the museum's blog about the artistic forms of presenting industrial textiles. So, I think it would be nice if you could share some of the outcomes of the project and i need to uh give you voice by clicking on yeah just one second uh, i think you have yeah, yeah now i am back uh, right and you can talk uh, about the work i demand a voice which was yeah <laughs> part of this project <laughs> yeah part of this project yeah right so uh firstly i just want to share my screen again and um i will just go briefly um, with our blog and uh, show you the article which data mentioned right uh, right now and uh, the first image what you see actually uh, uh, this article is uh, like summing uh, sum up, uh, trying to sum up uh, this uh, initiative and this uh, like support residency and as that I mentioned it was like very nice uh, cooperation during the pandemic because we just try to uh, uh, support artists and curators but also try to cooperate with them uh, and uh, there we are not only the individual projects but also um, artists try to reflect uh, and um, trying to um, connect their creative thinking in terms of their collection. Uh, it was the like main topic as that I mentioned already. And uh, then we, uh, we uh, as a result, uh, we have very interesting uh, different and various forms uh, of artistic representations in connection with the industrial textiles. And this image uh, actually represents how the industrial textile is um, displayed uh, currently at the museum and we are in the process of uh, like researching uh, this material uh, from the uh, different time of like actually Soviet era uh, and yeah you can like uh, when, when you find time if you are interested you can 
read this article, but I will just uh, uh, briefly talk about these uh, different um, artworks. And firstly, this is like Nino Zirakashvili's uh, uh, project. And uh, it, this is actually the second uh, artist book which uh, she made for them in cooperation with the museum. And it's called Herbarium. And it's very interesting that uh, actually uh, it, the title of this uh, book refers to the uh, um, pattern of the industrial textile itself. And uh, when we try to classify this um, and textile material, we find out that lots of them has uh, been designed with the um, different motifs of the plants. Uh, sometimes they are more abstract uh, in a way, but uh, there are certain of uh, colorful flowers and different parts of the plants we can see. And Nino you know, just tried to redesign them in terms of the uh, book and tried uh, trying to refer with the um, uh, collective labor, uh, which sometimes um, like, um, uh, uh, how I can say, it's like forgotten uh, uh, in terms of history, because sometimes uh, this is not very much distanced in, in a time, but uh, we don't remember this uh, usually. And this is something, uh, um, uh, 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 let's say, fixed in a time or like fragile, a thing which we do not actually thinking about. And the artist tried to uh, um, give uh, the visitor possibility to rethink about the collective memory of near uh, near past and to uh, each of the page uh, just uh, is very like uh, sensual uh, and uh, tactile in terms of the using real textiles of the um, from this collection um, yeah, second project which also represented the textile in different way uh, was cooperative project. I just, uh, yeah, close up my screen like this. Uh, and uh, here we see the cooperation of two artists like Sandro uh, Sula Beridze and Nino Shatverashvili. And they focused uh, on these very small, teeny parts of the textiles. And uh, here we see that mostly when we classified the textiles, they are like um, the huge materials or like important materials, or how we see, how we already represented in terms of the permanent collection, which uh, which uh, Salome already showed us. Uh, but here we see that uh, we have in this uh, industrial textile uh, such kind of very small, teeny materials. And artists try to refer to these um, leftovers, let's say that uh, these leftovers are the, uh, has the same interesting uh, importance uh, in terms of the classifying them as an objects and collection, part of the collection. And with this uh, specific uh, lens, they try to uh, focus on the details and uh, um, engage visitors to discover these details and patterns of different uh, textiles. And I just, um, assess, uh, uh, this um, object gives me the association of the, um, very chaotic uh, order in terms of uh, um, the um, displaying them like this, but to find some beauty in this chaotic and uh, detailed uh, versions of the uh, installation itself. And you, you just have this possibility to look through the pattern. And the last, uh, um, one of the last project I just want to uh, talk about, uh, with you right now is the game, uh, which is again the cooperation uh, between two artists, um, Naili Vahani and Tamar Bojorishvili. And they did uh, and research the uh, pattern again, but they uh, did uh, not only the object itself, but game. Um, and uh, there are two games, like one of the uh, game called Memory Game, as you see here uh, on the uh, board. There are different patterns and visitors, um, and, like interested persons, are engaged to um, see this, uh, to, to uh, find the same patterns here uh, of the uh, different textiles. Uh, and there was also a uh, main interest uh, with the name of the textiles because the name and titles of these textiles are very important as well. And the uh, other uh, game is like, it's called sensual game, or like a sensory game, sorry. Uh, and it's uh, more focused on the uh, sensibility and tactility of the textile itself. And we know that different species of the textile 
has different uh, tactility. And uh, mm, yeah, this is uh, also the small uh, teeny parts uh, from this game. And uh, actually, I just want to mention that uh, at our museum, we have different educational programs. And uh, this project uh, can be very much implemented with the, uh, mm, in terms of this like activity, which uh, again, uh, engage the visitors to participate and to think about the textiles and uh, its tactility and it's like patterns and so on. Um, yeah, that, that's the, I just also, also um, shared with you the uh, link of this article uh, and um, there was not only this uh, project, you know, uh, these are only some parts of, of the artistic forms. We just try to, uh, I just try to summarize uh, in one of the article, but actually we also have different articles from different participants. And uh, there are different uh, themes, uh, for example, the authorship, and uh, um, which is very important part uh, in terms of the researching uh, industrial textile. And uh, these perspectives can be continued by my colleague, uh, Data, uh, who can uh, talk about more about research project, which we realized uh, to together with uh, other artists. And for example, one of the interesting data was this uh, project with Nino Kriwishvili we yes. did. And uh, yeah, we can all also see this in, on our blog, but please tell us more deep about her research. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's, well, you know, I, I, it's always like this, also the last, with the last workshop, I was always trying to find some balance and maybe justify this much online work that we're doing. And then, you know, one, one good thing with this is that, you know, a lot of things that we do specifically for online presence is that it, it stays there. So, uh, and the material is available, though in a very different form. I've already uh, shared two more links in the chat section, uh, where, uh, which, uh, two different works by two artists. One of them is uh, I, I Demand a Voice that I mentioned by artist Tamuna Jabashvili. And uh, it deals a lot with the topic that uh, is not only specific, I believe, to Soviet textiles, but maybe to industry in general, but also maybe Soviet, with the Soviet silk and its production in Georgia, it was also something that came up very much from the material is that when we were sorting this, we had to start somewhere because it's a, a lot of material and if you imagine most of them come on more or less A4s with uh, uh, textiles on it and um, then they have information in very uh, mixed ways. Uh, sometimes they say who the author was, sometimes it says who the designer was or the artist or sometimes it has ears, sometimes some of these details combined. Uh, it's very mixed. Sometimes it's written very officially, sometimes it's just you know with the pencil. Later forms they are just not even printed forms but regular A4s and they're pinned there and you know with little pieces and they're written. If, if you go through this material on the blog you will uh, discover it and I encourage you to uh, see this post on the blog in your own rhythm because I think it creates a very nice because we try to also bring uh, the uh, tactility and the, uh, the textiles themselves as much as it is possible through the screens uh, right now. Um, and uh, the work that uh, Tam and uh, uh, yeah, when we were sorting these ones, we, we decided let's start with the names and the authors, either designers or the artists, because the names, they also overlap. So we started to group them, you know, like we, we categorize uh, items at the museum, we need to research them. And then uh, many of them did not even have any name, like designer or artist or somebody, you know, like some who did anything with this material other than the factory's name that's mentioned on them. And we started with the pile that I think, first of all, we've labeled it as uh, without author, but then we realized, uh, I mean, they can't be without author. They have authors. It just, it's just unknown authors. So we started and this pile started to grow. It became really big. Um, and uh, this somehow, uh, we realized it was an important thing because it's a story of people who were working on this creatively. And it's also a story of a lot of people who were part of the industry uh, that, you know, also disappeared. And these stories are just going to be, even today, they're very hard to find and collect. And it's going to be even harder uh, to find it uh, later. And uh, some of the artists, uh, 
uh, they uh, you know can still be approached and the interviews can be collected some of the material in these little pieces and fragments uh, tell us something and it's also to give them presence and to sort of like identify what these textiles are and uh, the work that Tamuna Jabashuli did is a, a, a light box uh, which is presented within a museum uh, box, so to say, a uh, framed box, wooden one with a glass, uh, uh, white box, as well, a glass surface that has two images overexposed. And it shows the open uh, uh, accounting journal, which is a uh, handmade, uh, sort of like, yeah, has a lot of different uh, sites that open that shows also, you know, this industry and its uh, accounting, maybe like to the level of absurdity details sometimes, uh, but of like reporting about everything. And then it also has this repeating phrase, which is, I demand a voice, uh, which is what came out, uh, is, was abstracted, I believe, from one of the interviews when one of the artists demanded a voice that's why you know this phrase came to me when <laughs> Mariam was trying to demand her voice here in zoom when it was not working mm -hmm. uh, and the, the other the second uh, blog post that I shared uh, is um, is what Mariam mentioned it's uh, what artist Nino Krivish really did and she it did what I uh, was saying like she started uh, meeting and interviewing people and gathering more material which is and then basically creating biographical entries of these people on the blog which uh, is a continuous process because we hope that there will be more stories that we can encounter, not only in Tbilisi, but there were also productions in other parts of Georgia, for instance, uh, Kutaisi, um, another uh, big uh, city in Georgia. Uh, and uh, it presents some of the textiles that these people particularly created that we know that they were the authors of. Uh, and it also tells their story, their education, what they did and how, they, uh, how the factory really functioned. So I think this is a very uh, important um, uh, aspect uh, in this uh, regard because it uh, uh, collect the stories and what uh, when we were talking in the beginning with Nino uh, it was uh, basically when you look up Tbilisi Silkwing factory this massive factory that existed uh, in uh, at Tbilisi, uh, th there was not much information even coming up online, neither in English or Georgian, maybe you know, some information. And she was like, maybe at least to make things Googleable, so to say, you know, like, so that you can find them online. And now there is already quite some information that comes up. But what is more important is that the stories of these people are kept and their biographies and, you know, like uh, a very important work that they were doing. And uh, also, you know, a lot of people, a story of a lot of people, basically that were involved in this process and the industry, not only artistically that is told and uh, you know, like talks about this. So uh, that I believe um, is quite uh, nice to do and also quite interesting to see on the blog because it also shows this um, textiles quite closely. And I hope you will also enjoy going through the blog and the different blog posts, not only this one, so there's quite a lot. And uh, as we talk about the blog, and I believe we need to wrap up uh, now uh, to stay within the time limit, but uh, when we talk about textiles is uh, another important um, uh, project that we just finished, we're still uh, uh, posting certain information is talking about textiles, but uh, now into talking about it, not maybe the ones necessarily from the factory and production perspective, but more anthropological perspective in terms of people's relation to textiles, the memory of the textile and how these things actually come up uh, change like understanding of it changes through time and it's uh, it was a nice turn we did a workshop called what is textile telling us uh, which uh, is uh, it, it was an online workshop like it was designed directly to be done online and uh, it consisted of uh, participants of different ages and backgrounds uh, who you know uh, there were lectures uh, connected to the topic of textile and this material also is coming up on the blog you can already find some of the articles and then uh, we were sort of like collecting and giving form to different approaches to what people think the textiles are telling and one of the important uh, topic that came up in the younger generation that everybody wanted to talk about or at least most of the participants was the Soviet time uh, textiles uh, and these industrial textiles not, not only silk necessarily and we called this the stories that were kept in the suitcase, I believe, because it's somehow yeah. turned out that many of us um, uh, keep uh, at home 
through, like through generations, you know, very nice textiles folded up nicely in the suitcase or somewhere in the drawer that, you know, one day you can make a beautiful dress out of it or something or give it to your daughter who will give it to her daughter, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You know, like, cause this is also through some of the stories that the participants were sharing. But then we realized uh, that it's the stories are also like these textiles, you know, that we keep somewhere that, you know, like, you know, one day we can do something with the stories. And then uh, a lot of different topics came up that concerned, you know, like very personal memories uh, about the textiles, uh, artistically speaking, or from production's perspective or design's perspective, but not only the, um, a, a lot of topics came up about grandmothers, for instance, but then we didn't, uh, the, it was quite diverse because uh, uh, some of the topics were also about the ethical side uh, of textile production and uh, producing so-called vegan leather uh, by a group of designers in Georgia, uh, etc. So these stories are also already on the blog that I will share now in the chat section. I just linked it. And Maria, yeah, you already linked it. Yeah. And yeah would you I like to say it. more about? Yeah, I will just uh, briefly summarize what you already starting to uh, share with us. And uh, for me, it was like very interesting project in terms of the uh, persons. Uh, it was like online format, as Data mentioned, but interesting was that uh, we find even with the, within this online format, uh, uh, person with uh, persons with different background and with different experiences and how uh, we uh, uh, unify this uh, difference in terms of the collective memory of textile. I just say it very difficulty, I, I, I just feel it, <laughs> but I try to be more specific uh, because uh, as Data mentioned, uh, all of us at the beginning of the project, all of us were focusing to introduce ourselves from our private uh, object. And uh, when you open this article, you will see this, uh, let's say, mosaic or like kaleidoscope of different uh, patterns and textiles, we, which we try to introduce ourselves. And it, it was at the beginning, just the uh, one uh, textile item which you have and it, which is like precious for you, just for you. But then within this uh, um, online meetings, we just realized that all of it uh, these very private patterns can be uh, um, important in terms of the uh, collective memory and in terms of the history and how these uh, private stories can be uh, um, important or can be precious uh, for other people. How we can just uh, talk about uh, some untold or hidden stories within the textile. So it gives us uh, lots of different perspectives uh, and it was like very interesting and we had also very interesting guests, uh, speakers, uh, which engaged the participants to share their experience and uh, for example, Anna Shanshiash really was talking about the folk motifs and one of the, uh, our participants share her experience, how this folk uh, um, pattern uh, childhood blanket was important for her and so on. These details you will see in the blog. I just don't want to bother you or take your time. Uh, um, but yeah, the main thing what was interesting was uh, this uh, sensual connections between the personal memory and the collective memory and the collectiveness, which we shared in within this online format. So yeah, I just wanted to add this from my side. Indeed, Mariam, thank you. Uh, I think, yeah, this, uh, even though it was in online format and we can't wait to meet, I mean, some of the participants we know in yeah, person, but not all, <laughs> and we can't wait to meet them in person at some point because, you know, like we spent uh, four very intensive meetings and uh, now we're like, yeah, maybe one day it will be possible to go for a walk and do it together. But what I'd like to sum up with here and maybe Salome, uh, I come to you with first question and then we can open discussion in this direction. And you have certain experience in Britain also working uh, at the Museum of Childhood, I believe, in this direction, right? Is what, you know, there's all this historical material that, I mean, needs a lot of work and, you know, we're working and it's always endless work to analyze and how to of present course. it. But there's also new material, uh, material like from this workshop that we were talking about that, you know, like something that comes from people that, you know, I mean, that's how they appeared at the museums also, also here in the beginning when we read in the reports of the Caucasian Sericulture Station, that's how, uh, I mean,
mean, individuals who donated things to the museum, you know, like, or someone they knew had something and bought it from them or got it from them, etc. So how, how do you see, I mean, I know it's a big question, but I think it's an important one here when we talk about museums engagement with the people, uh, like what, what role can it have or like what kind of activities, maybe from your experience, uh, can be not only at the Silk Museum, I believe also in a lot of other museums around the world that also, I mean, these are buildings that are within, let's talk about the museums in the cities, are placed within certain parts of the city and they play a role in it. So what do you think they can do in terms of you know, like getting uh, people and their stories inside the museum and then outside back to the people, so to say? If you want to share some ideas about it and if others have some questions or thoughts, please help us out and share. Yes, of course. And I'll try to make it brief because I think we're running out of time, we are over time already. So um, what you were mentioning, it's a very important topic because uh, uh, on the one hand, of course, we have uh, uh, some documentation about each object that we have in the museum. We have inventory books and um, how to say very dry information about uh, them. But uh, on the other hand, there is this uh, concept of uh, object biography, which is now quite um, important in museology because um, uh, all the time when visitors come, they don't only want to know the date of the object or the material or something mm -hmm. very um, technical, but also maybe the historist who was the owner of this object, what was the history behind it, why it was donated or how it came to museum and so on. So this is the information which uh, most of the time uh, is absent from the museum records. And this is where um, it is very important to uh, have these different communities come to the museum and share their stories, their information because they can and just uh, fill these gaps of the information that we have in the museums. And especially in our museum, uh, uh, we lack uh, the um, older um, documentations of the collections. And uh, sometimes we you know very uh, small information about the objects. And uh, of course, this uh, kind of interactions with people can uh, give us surprisingly uh, more much information about uh, each collection or object. Uh, and um, uh, this uh, um, project about the Soviet textiles uh, proved us that uh, it is uh, so, so important to uh, listen to different uh, kinds of people and uh, attract uh, different um, kinds of uh, visitors in the museum. Uh, uh, for example, uh, these uh, our neighbors which uh, uh, live around the museum, um, but uh, most of them were not even, uh, uh, had not even uh, visited the museum ever. And during this uh, festival, we tried to do some surveys, uh, uh, how, what they know about the museum and uh, uh, why they uh, don't, ha had not uh, visited uh, us before. And of course, it was not an easy pro uh, process, uh, but we still managed to attract some of them in the museum and uh, we got some information from them. So it is always very useful uh, for us, for the museums, but also for these different kinds of communities because um, they get a sense of some connection with the museum and they discover some new information and uh, new uh, environments that they didn't have before. So I think it's kind of a mutual cooperation in this case and very important. That is when meeting each other would be a possibility again. And uh, doing yes, events of course. And gathering. <laughs> that and I didn't the, mention, but when the museum renovates. Hopefully soon. Yeah. But anyway, uh, online connection is also important and gotcha. online uh, relations. So yeah. like, That's all we have. Now. That's all we have for now, and this this also yeah, you know, allows us to reach people uh, outside, you know, the physical location where they can come to the event. We were also saying this as part of workshop that participation was not bound to just being in Tbilisi, but you know, people from outside the Tbilisi could also join. Yes, so. it has this advantage. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, let's you know, let's try to find something, <laughs> some advantages. Yes, of course. <laughs> I think like for the discussion, we can. I mean, we can uh, also use the microphones for this uh, because it's not a lot of people. So I think we can. Uh,
mm -hmm. able yeah, to yeah. do that. Definitely. So if someone is um, wants to say, yeah, sorry, there was some sound. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So maybe uh, whoever wants to talk can raise their hands, and then that I can unmute or. Uh, yeah, we got a nice comment. People had to leave because, you know, because of the time. But yeah, yeah. If, uh, I think I already did the unmute. Or... No. Yes. Maybe not for a while. No. No, they are still on mute. Let's do this manually. Yeah, yeah but manually. now you, they can unmute themselves. Okay. Anyone wants to say something? Questions, comments, please. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I would just like to say, if, if I may, um, there's a very strong interest in this kind of material in, 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 in our country here. It's very strong. Uh, lots of people, mainly women, are interested and in working in it, but uh, working with it, uh, and, and in particular, silk because we don't have so much silk, you know, it's a very important thing. Um, and there have been connections between Georgia and England to do with a bit of um, work and activity in terms of learning about silk. Um, it's, it's very popular. <laughs> you, could, you could find a few people, quite a few people, especially in Tbilisi. I don't know about the other countries so much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think like, I mean, one thing that you mentioned is also particularly important now when we talk about, and the workshop was also an example of this, the gender aspect that comes out of it, because, you know, it's mostly, also the workshop participants, I, yeah, it was all female, right? Uh, and uh, then also, I mean, in terms of the region, of course, like textile and silk in particular, when we talk about the post-Soviet areas, is very, uh, uh, I mean, very much connected, and there's uh, countries in, Central Asia, uh, you know, like have rich traditions of working uh, on it. And actually also as part of, and I, I, this was also because it is part of uh, Art Prospect, uh, working with other countries. And we did the residency exchanges before, and uh, we had artists, uh, Tatiana Fyodorova from Moldova, who works on the topic of industrial textile a lot. So it was very interesting to see it in relation to different contexts within the post-Soviet context. And then we had the Lara Kaipova uh, from Uzbekistan, who works with the uh, traditional ikat uh, technology, uh, but she integrates it in her contemporary art with the contemporary imagery in very diverse and interesting forms. So uh, she did, uh, I mean, and you know, when you get to people like this and exchanges like this, it tells so much about the stories and the layers. In Dilara's case, she gave a wonderful lecture about, you know, uh, this uh, textiles from Uzbekistan. She helped us with uh, material in our collection uh, that we, you know, like connected to the work that she knows and does. And she's an artist. Uh, she works with, uh, you know, others who do the craft and the traditional uh, craftsmanship. Uh, uh, she uh, worked on her own project. Then we uh, afterwards, uh, after she left sometime, uh, sometime after, I don't remember exactly, uh, we did uh, 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 an exhibition with her work. So, you know, these kind of connections, are, that's why we call it collections and connections as well. But yeah, uh, it, it is a particularly important topic uh, within the region too, with the, some countries. I mean, be it on the industry level or the traditional crafts, that's what I wanted to say. <laughs> but, yeah, thank you. And uh, thank you for your very kind comments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's it for the questions. Uh, yeah, I suppose so. Thanks everyone, Salome, Mariam, thank you. Um, 
for doing this together again one more nice presentation susan mm -hmm. natasha cci arts link for helping us to organize this uh everyone who joined uh despite uh time differences because i know for some people it's morning or afternoon or evening but yeah this is um how it works there will be the recording of this i believe that people can access afterwards to see and the material that we were mentioning again is available on our blog and also more images of the projects on the museum's Facebook page. Uh, so um, yeah, it's accessible and we are also always accessible over email if you'd like to connect to us. And yeah, we would just want to wish you a nice morning, afternoon, evening, <laughs> depending where you are. And thanks again for joining us today.